Hi, I'm Bob Ethington. And I'm Nick Nicholas. And this is From Akron and Beyond. On today's episode, uh, well, we're in Akron, but we're going a bit beyond all the way to Youngstown and beyond that as well, if you can imagine such a thing, <laughs> with our special guest, Frank Sessich, who um, has a uh, very interesting background and career playing with a number of bands that you guys will all be familiar with. And uh, we're really happy to have him with us here today. So, hi, Frank. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you doing, Bob? You're, Nick? Yep. Good. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> Real excited to have you on here. I remember going to the Kent Community Store, oh, hell, I don't know, in the early 70s and buying this uh, Blue Ash album that I heard so much about, and I wasn't disappointed. A great record, man. Oh, thank you. Also, I should mention that Frank has a new book out, a memoir called Circumstantial Evidence, Untold Stories of an Original Rock and Roller. Talks about his days with Blue Ash and with the uh, notorious Stiff Baders. Also, uh, Club Wow, the Deadbeat Poets, and other bands he's played with and other people he's played with. A lot of good stories in there. So uh, you'll want to check that book out. But um, let's just start at the very <laughs> beginning, Frank. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Sharon, Pennsylvania. Sharon. It's about oh, yeah, 15 okay. uh, miles from Youngstown. Last stop on Interstate 80 going west. And are you still living there? Still live, still live in the valley. I live in Hermitage, Pennsylvania. It's oh, another town okay. right next to it. Yeah, still okay. live there. Now, um, when you think back, I, I this always sounds like a pedestrian question, but I always find it fascinating. When you think back to like what you what what got you into music originally? Like what what was the first thing that made you want to pick up a guitar or or just really start responding, be it radio or whatever? What what was uh, it? It was definitely the Beatles, uh, and okay. uh, right before they were on the Ed Sullivan Show, mm -hmm. I used to go ice skating a lot. At, at Bill Forum, it has a big lake, and they would blast in the late January of '64, blasting the Beatles songs. Out. Okay. So it was kind of cool doing that. And then when they were on TV, that was it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to be in a band then, so I started playing harmonica because I didn't have a guitar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, see if you'd been smart, you would have stuck with that. I'm, yeah, I'm, really. I'm a drummer, and every time I'm I'm packing yeah. up after a gig late at night, yeah. I'm always like, why didn't I? play the harmonica yeah. i'd be out of here just put yeah. it in my pocket and leave yeah. Yeah, we, so we mentioned before that uh ed sullivan show appearance of the Beatles has changed so many lives you know I, it's gotten to the point that i hear that so often that i'm beginning to wonder what was the difference why was it was it because well i mean partially it's a demographic thing right because the yeah. difference between elvis and the beatles is only like four or five years, but it could have been a lifetime. I, I, I always thought it was um, after John Kennedy was killed. Yeah, okay. And there was a period of mourning, and he was the, the young people's real hero. Actually, right. I actually yeah. shook his hand, it's in that book, uh, there, oh, when, wow. when he campaigned okay. in 1960 in Sharon. Uh -huh. I was right up front with my uncle, and he shook my hand. Oh, it was pretty cool. I was nine years old then. But I think in, in the, what was it, before they were on six weeks before the Beatles came in, uh, after yeah. that. No, maybe ten weeks. Yeah. But... All of a sudden, everyone was so sad about that, and there was this joyous thing coming from overseas sure, with four yeah. good-looking guys that could play and sing. And I think all that pent-up sadness and everything just went for them. That's I've really, always, I've always yeah. thought that. That's it's interesting. A, that's a good way of, of looking yeah. at it. Yeah. I always, I guess, my take on it was always that Elvis kind of just seemed like from another planet. There was something approachable about the yeah, Beatles, exactly. As, as you know, as amazing as they were, and talented, and charming, and everything else, they were still. They kind of seemed like guys you could hang out with and talk with. Oh, right? yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So now, okay, so you see the Beatles, you're hearing the Beatles, and suddenly you are getting the uh, inspiration to be a rocker yourself. So exactly. did you... Uh, How'd you get your first guitar? Is that what you said? Uh, yeah, well, you said guitar. harmonica first. My, I, guess, I had so. the harmonica first, and my uh, Uncle Jack gave me an old Stella guitar. He used to be a... Um, a co had a uh, radio show in Youngstown at WKBN, Cowboy Jack and the Canyon Riders. Uh, and he was a big big celebrity there okay. in, in the 1930s. But when the war broke out, he joined the uh, the Army and was in General Patton's Army almost in every 
the Africa, wow. Italy, uh, Luxembourg, yeah. France in the occupation of Germany. Anyway, he gave me the first guitar. And then uh, my mom bought me a, a Harmony Monterey in 1965, okay. early 65. So it was my first proper guitar. Okay. It was about $70, brand uh -huh. new. So then I got in a band, kids in my neighborhood and everything. We started playing. And, and what, uh, how old would you have been? I had been about 14 then. Okay. 13, right. 14. Yeah. yeah. So um, that first band, I guess, I'm guessing you played cover tunes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did a couple. Uh, actually, wrote a couple too. Uh -huh. My first one was called "Let Me Go," and it was a, a cheap rip off of the Kinks' uh, set, <laughs> "Set Me Free." Yeah. Even the title was. <laughs> well, that's so, a good sign to rip off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it wasn't too bad. And my friend Beaver, who lived in the neighborhood, he was a little bit better guitarist than I was, and he he we did a lot of cover songs. He wrote songs too, mm -hmm. and then. Um, uh, we got Jim Kenzer from Blue Ash oh, in ninth okay. grade, uh, the lead singer. So you met that early. So we met that early on yeah. the first day of school in ninth grade, and he became our lead singer. So we could sing pretty good. He was a great singer. Okay. Uh, so now when, when we were talking about having you on, Frank, um, Nick and I were talking yeah. about it and about about you. <laughs> Only saying nice things, right, Nick? Very <laughs> yeah, nice yeah, yeah. But, um, but Nick started talking about Blue Ash. Now... I have to say that I like came to this area later, yeah. so I was not really. I'd heard the name Blue yeah. Ash. I was really not familiar with your yeah. music, and um, I heard. Uh, I guess Brad played us a song. Yeah, he must have. And and um, and I was stunned by how great it was. I was like, this is like power pop. You're so but ahead a little of the game. Heavier. Yeah. I can't imagine that there was. Much going on then. So I really want to hear about Blue Ash. I want to hear about how that started and what happened with your, you know, with your first album and just oh, sure, the whole sure. thing. I'm very uh, curious. Blue Ash started in uh, July of 1969. Jim Kenzer and I, the lead singer, had been in different bands beforehand. And I was in a band called the Mother Goose Band, which Steve Bayers became sort of my replacement later on. Oh, and, really? and they turned oh, into a different okay. thing. They were a cover band when I was with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to form Blue Ash. So uh, we... Uh, Practice and practice. We got Bill Yendrick to be the lead guitarist and David Evans from Warren on drums. And we went over to see Jeff Jones in Youngstown, who was the big booking agent and manager. He had Glass Harp, Human Beings, all these bands. Okay. So we did a couple a cappella songs for him in his house, just showed up one day. <laughs> and we didn't realize that he had just severed ties with uh, uh, Glass Harp the day before. So we just kind of stepped in. He says, okay, I'll take you on. Okay. So he started getting his jobs, the freak out in, in October 3rd, 1969 was the first job. We played 100 jobs the first year, got oh. a big following around wow. Ohio, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. Yeah. And then our guitarist quit to go to Kent State University, <laughs> Bill Yendrick. So we got Bill Bartlett in, who became my uh, uh, songwriting partner. Mm -hmm. And he's the one on the album. So that was the album uh, lineup. And uh, we started playing everywhere. We were playing 200 50 to 275 days a year. Now, when you say everywhere, do you mean everywhere around the country or no, everywhere no, uh, locally? Uh, like, uh, uh, try, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia. Okay. That's so, sort of five-state wow. area. Okay. Wow. And, yeah. and, but we were always on the road playing. We, we played everywhere. In um, the summer of... 1972, we started doing demos at Peppermint Productions in Youngstown, mm -hmm. which is a still a going concern. Yeah, And uh, they sent out our first demos and to all the major record companies. We weren't expecting much, but four companies wanted to sign us wow. right from the demos. And so we uh, eventually signed with Mercury Records. Polydor wanted us, MGM, and another one, uh, Metro Media th thing. Paul Nelson signed us. Oh, wow. Legendary, yeah, Paul legendary Nelson. rock critic, and he also signed the New oh, York yeah. Dolls yeah. Uh, to Mercury. So we were, too. Yeah, we were, yeah, and Stooges. and uh, I think uh, Velvet Underground on one of the later albums. Well, the, yeah, the, 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 too, on there. So anyway, Paul signed us up, and uh, we recorded a Peppermint February nineteen seventy three, and the album came out in nineteen uh, in. Uh, May of 1973. Okay. And got critical acclaim everywhere. Critics loved it. Rolling Stone, every magazine. We were we were everywhere. But just didn't have the sales figures. Yeah. Now, so, what label was that on? Mercury. Mercury. Same as... Uh, as us, the Bizarro. Yeah. 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 I remember hearing that. Uh, one or two cuts on WMMS. That's why I went out and bought it. Yeah. Was, yeah. MMS was playing. We got a lot of airplay around the country. But we just couldn't break the big markets. New yeah. York or... or um, uh, L.A., but we were Detroit, 
St. Louis, Chicago, yeah. uh, Miami. We got huge airplay and toured around all those areas. Okay, too. now now Nick is a big fan of you guys. Yeah. When did you first hear them, Nick? Right, right, right when the record came out, it was debuted. Uh, well, it wasn't debut, but they, it's a new record that MMS was playing right around the time of its release. And just and dug funny, it and bought it. Huh? Yeah. There's okay, a funny yeah. story about that, Nick. Uh, we took. Uh, John Grazier from Peppermint, Paul Nelson, and I took the record up to WMMS, you know, because they go around with the records, so I got to take you around. And we're in the glass booth just like this, looking yeah. in, yeah. and Paul shows him the record, Blue Ash, and Denny Sanders, you remember him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> he goes, come on in. He's playing a Led Zeppelin album, and he takes the needle, and he crashes it right over the Zeppelin oh. album. He goes, Blue Ash guys just came in here. They brought their new record, and we're going to give a couple <laughs> listens to a couple songs. And wow. he puts it on. He plays Abracadabra, Have You Seen You, and, and Dusty Old Fair goes. He goes, that's great. And it's just so funny how different radio is now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was, yeah. I mean, he just ripped yeah. it right across the Zeppelin <laughs> album. You know, a couple years later on, it would have been a different story because, like Bob mentioned, uh, a little bit of a, I don't know, Power pop, you know, but yeah. a few years later, you know, Greg Shaw from Bomp is promoting power pop, you know, this new this new thing. But you guys were were there three or four years before that. Oh yeah, uh, Greg, by the way, was a big champion of our band. Yeah. And my new book that's coming out at Christmas time, not that way anymore. I got a huge chapter about Greg. Oh, I love the guy. He was so good to the Bizarros yeah. and my uh -huh. label Clone Records. He was a a champion of uh, of independent yeah. independent music. Oh, he he really was, and I have some very very funny Greg stories and everything. Oh. But he he even he even brought Lisa out there when we were recording the Not mm -hmm. That Way anywhere. Flew yeah. her out, and what a great guy. But um, yeah, there's like I said in the new book, Not That Way anymore will be out, and there's a lot of stories about that in there. And of course, I was on Bomp Records with yeah. him too. So. Yeah. yeah. So, um, was there, uh, for, forgive my ignorance on this, but is there one Blue Ash album, two? No, there's, there are two original ones. Okay. The first one came out in 1973, was on, on Mercury Records, no right. more, no less. Then we tried to get, a lot of other labels were thinking of signing us. We almost got signed to Columbia, wow. almost got signed to RCA, uh -huh. almost got signed to Nimpera Records with Nat Weiss from uh, uh, Beatles fame. But mm -hmm. anyway... We were getting fed up with it. We, uh, they were all falling through. And then we got signed to Playboy Records in 1976. Oh, okay. oh wow. And our second album, Front Page News, came up. Uh -huh. and, and we had regional hits with a single look at you now all over the place, mm -hmm. especially in the South and Texas, almost every station in Texas. So they flew us out to um, L.A. to finish the album. Mm -hmm. And um, while we were recording at Village Recorders, the Front Page News album, two different studios, Fleetwood Mac was in one of them doing Tusk and uh, Kansas was doing the final mixes of uh, <laughs> A Point of No Return. Okay, wow. So that we were in good company there. And yeah. Kansas guys were great. I got to sit in a lot of the sessions and just listen. Oh, really? It was okay. amazing hearing like dust in the wind, uh -huh. strings on and everything. But right. that was cool. So that, that came out then. Now that one did a lot better. It came right out of the box. It sold like 55,000 copies, and we had regional hits everywhere of the album. Then Playboy, a few months later, went out of business. Oh, yeah. They just canned the whole record company because they had lost so much money. Right. So that was the end of it, and we were just out in the cold again. Wow. And right after that, I started playing with Stib in 1979. Yeah, because 76 going mm -hmm. into 77, that's when there was the Funk. recession oh, yeah. in mm -hmm. the record industry, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, we know a number of bands yeah. that suffered from that one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, Tin Huey was one yeah. of them. Uh, yeah, and they, they, they just yeah. sold the whole Biz record company. Right. right. Bizarro's, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the Bizarro's as well, yeah. sure. Yeah. Look at you now. Take number one, Mrs. Sessions Bartlett. Okay, so when you guys are writing those songs, I know this is going to maybe an odd question, but <laughs> that's my job <laughs> as the odd questions. Um, how conscious uh, were you of what you were doing? I mean, with this sort of heavier power pop sound it's almost like were you thinking beatles but yeah cranked it, up what, or? what we liked to do the cover songs that we did at blue ash we did about half originals and half cover songs right from the start yeah so we would do stuff like the hollies the kinks um the who we were especially we did all of tommy one night okay. yeah, and, and youngstown playing with glass heart 
But we wanted the songs. We wanted three minute songs like we loved when we were kids right. in the early '60s. So right. a lot. Of, I mean, a lot of my songs sound like the Searchers or there's you know the Birds to overtones and everything, and yeah. especially the Who and Beatles. There's a lot of that in there, yeah. and that's what we wanted to do. At the same time, Raspberries were doing the same thing. Yeah. Right. We started about 10 months before them, though. Mm-hmm. They started in like 1970. And then other bands were coming out around the country. And of course, you had Bad Finger in, in England and um, a Big Star. You know, so, we were just talking about Big yeah. Star. I was going to mention them. They would have yeah. fit that, too. Yeah. Right? So we fit in that category. And then right after that, all of a sudden, the power pop. Yeah. And it was starting to come around. I've never minded that tag. I thought it was a good tag. Yeah, it's well, a good it's, tag. It's not like non power pop. No, yeah. The opposite. <laughs> not the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Powerless pop. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what we have today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's funny, though, because so many of these bands that we're talking about, um, I guess I'd even include the Raspberries, to, uh, although they did have the one really big hit song, but almost all those bands are loved, beloved, and yet they never fulfilled what I think the commercial potential was seen to be. That's exactly it, and that's yeah. probably... Big Star being a classic example. That, perfect right. example. It's yeah. almost like a blues thing with all the guys in the 1920s and 30s, Robert Johnson or Blind Lemon Jefferson. Well, he had some success, but Johnson mm-hmm. never sold more than 1,500 records in his entire life. Yeah. You know? And then that's, that's that myth with it, I think. And it's kind of not on that scale, but yeah. with the power pop, it still goes on. I mean, I get letters from people every day all sure. over the world. Yeah, so, so you're sold to the devil. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah what, if, what if? Yeah. <laughs> well, the I think the I think the the power of that kind of music is just they're catchy songs, mm-hmm. and so there's always going to be an appeal there, yeah. you know, to people. People are going to, you know, down the road, ten years from now, whatever, twenty years from now, are going to hear these songs and still respond to them because yeah. they're just good catchy songs they still played the, on a, an acoustic guitar and they'd be a catchy song still yeah. to this day people cover i've had over 50 people cover my songs so wow that's pretty crazy including yeah. really famous people like billy joe armstrong yeah. or or the records from england they covered yeah. well, the record. Yeah. what did they do of abracadabra really yeah it came as a free um uh ep on their uh first album i remember that yeah, yeah, i was working at a record store yeah. that came out i had that with yeah. the ep yeah, yeah. That, yeah that, that i didn't was make it. the connection wow uh, mike monroe from uh, hanai rocks did a uh, uh-huh. million miles away. there's a lot of people have done wow. a lot of stuff nikki but, sudden yeah. yeah wow well tell us about the billy joe armstrong project how that uh, happened. i didn't even know about it and okay. my friend cynthia ross of green day folks yeah out there, sure she you know. was uh, she's a uh, bass player in the b girls and plays in a band called new york junk now and okay. she used to be Stiv's girlfriend in the in the dead boy states no. okay yeah, and uh she she uh called me one day and she goes billy joe armstrong just recorded not that way anymore you gotta be kidding me <laughs> you know it's going to come out in a video so there's a video of it it was out as a single and it was featured on that album so mm-hmm. it was, and he did a great cover yeah of it. it's beautiful yeah. it's good song he really did it well so i was real tickled with it. and they released that all over the world so that was cool so things just happen like that yeah. you find out about it and yeah this was a pandemic project of yeah d- yeah during during yeah. during the covid virus he was just making a, a cover song recording one every week and putting it out with a video so okay. how that had to be a tough week for him he did it with <laughs> his kids other members of green day and stuff and i think on the ninth week he put ours out okay and it's on the the album so well that is cool yeah Yeah, real cool yeah yeah but this is from akron and beyond i'm bob ethington with my co-host nick nicholas we are here with frank sesage talking about his days in blue ash and we're going to be talking about a whole lot of other fascinating things that he's been involved with over the years. And he has a book out, Circumstantial Evidence, which is untold stories of an original rock and roller. And you should go and check this book out wherever you get your books. And we just learned he has a new book coming out uh, come uh, Christmas. So yeah, later. new book. Uh, not that way anymore. Mm-hmm. It'll be out in Christmas time. And you can order the, any of those on Amazon. Um, Barnes and Noble online, uh, Get Hip Records in Pittsburgh. Okay. Usually has some kind of deal with them. Okay, uh, it's it's available everywhere. Okay, we'll get all to, around the world. We'll get to the upcoming book okay. here in a few minutes, but yeah. I want to hear more about that. But so um, I have a feeling I have a rough idea of where this is going to go. But <laughs> what happened with Blue Ash? Then? Blue Ash. Then after the second second album, 
didn't make it. We just kind of drifted apart. We had been playing together and been together for 10 years. You're playing oh, a lot of games, wow. yeah. too. That's and, rough. And, yeah, and well. it was just heartbreaking. We were just maybe on the verge of getting famous, and then the Playboy stopped. So we just called it a day. People were having kids and everything, families right. already. So that right. was it. Uh, and right around that time, Stib came to visit me. He always did on the holidays. We were friends since we were teenagers. Oh. And I was the first guy, actually, that ever brought him on stage. And uh, he came up we, with Cynthia, the same girl I was just telling you about. And this is late 1978. And we wrote the song the last year in, in uh, our living, my living room in our apartment in Sharon. And we liked the way how our voices sounded. So they invited me up to Cleveland. And I recorded with Johnny Blitz and Jimmy Zero of the Dead Boys. And we did um, It's Cold Outside <laughs> the last year. And another one that was just released on a single um, called It's All Right, the old Adam Faith song okay. that night. Yeah. And uh, Stip took the tapes with him to um, L.A. and met Greg Shaw out there. Greg Shaw loved yeah. the, the stuff, so he signed us up to a deal. Okay. And that's when we started recording in 1979 there. Now, the, now, did you you said did you know Steve from high school? Uh, yeah, when I was in high school, uh -huh. we didn't go to the same high school, but I would see him at all the teen dances. I think I met him in 1967. So is he a Pennsylvania guy? No, he okay. lives in Gerard, but it's only about eight miles from I gotcha. my house. So I would see him at the uh, they used to have carousel teen clubs in Hubbard and Miles and Youngstown, yeah. and I met him at those places, and we became fast friends that way. So okay. I knew him during those days. Then, in sometime around '69. He said he was a harmonica player, <laughs> and and I was putting up a pickup band just to play this little outdoor festival. So I got him, uh, Steve Acker from uh, Law, the band, uh, Myron Grumbacher, who later played with Pat Benatar oh, okay. back from Youngstown, uh -huh. yeah. and Goog Yendrick from uh, uh, Blue Ash, and uh -huh. me, and we backed him up. But he didn't have a harmonica. He would just make <laughs> harmonica sounds with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> but it would sound just like a harmonica. <laughs> so we did some Stones and Yardbird songs. Right. And it's it was the first time he was ever on stage. And all of a sudden, he, I said, this guy's nuts, you know. He takes out a, a can of whipped cream, and he's shaking it in his crotch. <laughs> yeah. you know? And he shoots it out into the audience. It's a little outdoor festival in Newton Falls. Then he takes a mic stand and throws it up in, in the air, clips his head on the way down, <laughs> big gash in his head. Right. Blood's running everywhere. So he's taking the whipped cream and blood and smearing it's like this pinkish orange uh, monster he looks like <laughs> so anyway people went nuts over him and i had to take him to this to the uh, uh emergency room to get sure. stitched up he yeah. had to get like 10 stitches so yeah that's the first time he was ever on stage and that was no. then, then he got into mother goose band after yeah. that yeah i think it's interesting um how how when people think about punk rock they what they uh uh, unless you're of a certain age and then you realize this. Um, the original punk rockers didn't, they came out of old school rock and roll. Yes. They definitely. came out, you know, they yeah. they liked the Yardbirds. Yes, they yeah, liked exactly, the Stones. Yeah. They liked yeah. bands like that. Sure, you can hear that in and, Cheetah and Jimmy's playing Johnny, Johnny right, Thunders. All absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Because at the time, you know, and it was, and I think this was more radical in Britain, you know, they were more like, this is year zero mm -hmm. kind of thing. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, all the old stuff is dead. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're starting over. But, of course, that was always a fraud, as mm -hmm. we know. I sure. mean, Joe Strummer was a old hippie that did folk music before yeah. the clash oh, yeah. and, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, had, a, like, a pub band before them. And, and of course, you know, Johnny Lydon, you know, Johnny Rot as Johnny Rotten famously, you know, had, like, I Hate Pink Floyd t-shirt yeah. and all that. Yeah. And then... You know, years later, you find out that he actually loved Pink Floyd and, and like Can yeah. and all these, you know, kind of weird, weird German bands yeah, and stuff. Oh, yeah, so um, I guess what I'm getting at here is just it is interesting. Like, I, I bet you there's people out there that would never have connected Stiv with, like, yeah. the kind of stuff that you first yeah. played with yes. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just yeah. because that was his reputation later. Well, he He's, always yeah. loved the pop stuff, you mm -hmm. know. He always loved the, and he loved the... Uh, Garage things, yeah, the nuggets kind of stuff, right? You know, uh, right, electric prunes, all that sure. kind of blues well, and goose. Which was really what that I guess punk originally the yeah. idea was was to get yeah. back to that kind of music. Sure, sure. yeah, three chords in the truth, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, two two and a half minute songs is, is yeah. plenty. Yeah. Well, you know, today in the car on a, on the way here, I was listening to Stiv's uh, disconnected record that that you're on. Yeah, also in and, and uh, after the the original classic album. There's a bunch of live cuts on there, you know, uh, and there's uh, all the old, old uh, British, you know, British uh, blues stuff. And, oh yeah, and yeah. Sub, you know, just 
good rock and roll that yeah. was on the radio in the 60s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, you mentioned with the whipped cream incident at the, at the festival. Was he into, like, the Stooges? And, big time, big so, time in the So, yeah, his influence. Well, it, uh, yeah. the, there was always the classic story when they Stooges played at uh, Cincinnati Stadium. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and the peanut butter. Yeah. Stiv is actually the guy that gave him the peanut butter. No. In the crowd. Yeah, oh, he is. Really? That story's been around for years, <laughs> and some people say it wasn't him. Uh-huh. But he called me the next day. He goes, if you see that, he goes, that was me that gave him the, the thing. And it was on TV things. But you can see on the back of, uh, I think, Bob Seger's Smoking Oak Peas album, mm-hmm. you could see Stiv right up at the front of the stage. Oh, and then okay. a- Iggy came on after that, I think. Yeah. And then even when you see Iggy on crowd surfing, you see Stiv right there. You can pick him right out of the yeah. crowd. And uh, he's, uh, he was the one that did that. Yeah, that was a, uh, a, classic. a classic performance. It was mm-hmm. on ABC. Do you yeah. remember that? It yeah. Was, yeah, it was... Yeah. Uh, they they were kind of covering it, thinking it was going to be sort of a Woodstock kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. Iggy comes out and walks across. Yeah, the that's, so that, I mean, he called me from Cincinnati, and he goes, "I'm the one that did that." Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so, um, so okay, so so with Blue Ash now having come to an end, you're what's happening then? Like, where? What does Stiv come next? In yeah, your Stiv okay. was next. We went to L.A. So you went right to and we Stiv. Were, yeah, we okay. were making singles for Greg Shaw out there. Okay. And then all of a sudden, they were going to get the Dead Dead Boys back for a few jobs. They had a, a job up in Canada, three nights at the Oriental Rock Palace. <laughs> and um, Jeff Magnum didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. So the other guys wanted to do it. So Stiv called me. He goes, you got the albums. Just learn the songs uh, overnight, you know. <laughs> and, and we'll fly you up tomorrow, and then we'll fly the next day to things. So I flew up to New York, rehearsed the songs, uh-huh. flew up to um, uh, Toronto, played the three days with them. While we were playing that, that was filmed for the DOA movie, the Sex Pistols movie. Oh, okay. So we were in that from that night. That was the first night I ever played with them. Then throughout oh, wow. October and November and December, they were getting jobs all over the East Coast, everywhere in Detroit. So I was just filling in, doing stuff. Yeah. And then when Cheetah fell and broke his wrist at Keith Richards' birthday party, and we were all there at the Roxy Roller Disco, <laughs> um, we got George in the band. George Cabanis. And then we had we had jobs at the Whiskey A Go, going tours all over the country. Uh, Frontier uh, booking was booking us. It was one of the Copeland's brothers, not okay. Miles, but uh, Ian, I think, was the... Uh, one of the, that had the booking he, he had I, I something I can't think it wasn't I one of the brothers had IRS records yeah and then the and other one had, had the booking the, yeah yeah so yeah. we went with the booking <laughs> agency and we were playing everywhere so we played all over and then Blitz left the band around May and we got David Steinberg in the band to play drums mm-hmm. Jimmy was still in it then, and and me and Stiv and George and then we did a tour all summer and uh Jimmy left the tour about mid July or so and we continued to tour four piece. We did the Erg Music Festival but we're not in the movie and we played along the west coast. We were supposed to go to Australia because they released a record there, but that fell through and then uh Greg says, Well let's do the album now, just connect it. So we did that in August mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. September of nineteen eighty. Okay. Okay. Bob mentioned a little bit about you mentioned George Cabanus. You know, he's just, yeah, I was going to ask how you guys knew George because I knew him. I mean, we both knew him very well. But from I played in a band called Unit Five, and okay. we used to play with Hammer Damage all the time, which George was in, of course. And uh, I just was curious how well, you guys I knew George knew him. from the Hammer Damage and the bands that were going on. And Hammer Damage would open up for the the Dead Boys sure. touring band. We had a lot. So when that happened, we just took George, asked George to be. Okay. Done with us, then we went. We played some jobs with Hammer Damage. Then uh, did you ever play the bank in Akron? Yes, many times. Because we played the bank in Akron many times as well. So there's a very good chance that I have met you before. Oh yeah, you look familiar. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. He, to Nick too. You guys both look very sixty funny. years later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my le- wife Lisa took tons of pictures at, at the bank when we were playing. So okay. there's a lot of those on my sites and everything. Okay. If you ever want to look at them, just go under the Stiv Bader's band. I got a whole album of oh, pictures. All right, I will definitely yeah. do that. Yeah, That's where I met Stiv Bader's. I you know hung out with him one night. It was actually at the bank. He wasn't playing. He was just there to see the bands yeah yeah Yeah, we would come down to all just see bands and hang Mm -hmm. out and there in jb's we played a lot yeah blue ash played a lot of jb's in the early days oh really okay so you're you're working with steve you're 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 playing it it sounds like you're an integral part of his music and what he's doing 
but it's always there's something sporadic about it. Am he, I am I picking up yeah, on that? Yeah, there okay. was. And he, we had a good band, and George was great. David was great. And we had a good band with Disconnected. So when the album came out, we were going to do do a tour, and we brought Brian James over from the yeah, band. Oh, right. he yeah, played with yeah. us on this last tour, uh-huh. and we played for about two three weeks on the East Coast, and. Um, Stiv had gone off after we recorded the uh, um, Disconnected album and joined the Wanderers in in uh, uh, England. They had a big uh, re- record contract with um, Polydor, I think. And they were guys from Sham 69 okay. minus Jimmy yeah. Percy. He wanted to have both bands going up one time. That mm-hmm. was impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're on different continents. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, you know, we were fed up. We didn't want it. And he... he they were giving him money and everything else. So it was an amicable breakup. We just said, yeah, yeah just go ahead. We just don't want to have two bands like that. Sure. So then uh, for about a year, we did some Blue Ash reunion things. George played with us, oh. Eddie Bess, and we played the JBs and, and I think the bank. And mm-hmm. I think uh, um, we opened when Stiv's band, The Wanderers, came to the um, uh, Agora in Cleveland. We opened up for them. So it was always that. And he'd write me all the time, wanted me to come over and join various things he was doing, but I didn't want to leave, move to England. It wasn't what yeah. I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And we were starting a family and everything, so uh, I, I joined Club Wow. Okay. In, in Cleveland with Jimmy Zero. Okay. Me in. Yeah. It was me, Jimmy, Billy Sullivan, who plays with Herman's Hermits now. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, the drummer was Jeff West, who played in the Waldos and Baloney okay. Heads and, and uh, played in... in uh, a lot of bands, you know, yeah. So. Yeah. We were together for like three years, 1982 to 85. Didn't play out as much. You know, we played at the Fantasy in, in Cleveland, the Agora, for opening up shows. We opened up for Meat Loaf and the Lords of the New Church. Played in Buffalo a few times, Youngstown. But we were mainly trying to get a record deal. Yeah. So we just wrote songs, recorded and recorded. They were never released until we just released a few years ago oh. on uh, uh, the, the album I gave you guys, uh-huh. uh, Nowhere Fast and... Uh, there's uh, like 16 songs on there and video from st- the videos we made. Okay, cool. Promotion videos and from videos from the Agora, uh-huh. opening up for Meatloaf and stuff. So that was a good band. Now, pretty soon, it's going to be released on vinyl from Peppermint Productions oh, nice. okay. in Youngstown. And they're releasing all kind of old Blue Ash things, too, mm-hmm. because there are still 200 and some Blue Ash tapes at Peppermint Whoa. in the vaults there. Wow. Because <laughs> we recorded once a month, a few days a month. For five years, that was our contract. With okay. them. Anytime we'd have new songs, we'd just rush and do them. Some are live, some are multi-track. But sure. great stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds like uh, so that takes us through nineteen. 19- <laughs> <stuff. Yeah. laughs> that yeah. takes us through nineteen eighty-five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, I started uh, managing a band called the Infidels. Okay, and I gave you uh-huh. that record, right. their first uh-huh. song too. And uh, Pete Revere was in that. Who's in Deadbeat Poets with me now? Oh, you can. And uh-huh. actually, John Corey and, and John Lumi. Two other infidels. They're in that. Mm-hmm. And I managed them. We had a record company called Scream Records put out things. And then around 1990, right when Stiv died, another of my best friends uh, killed himself mm. same week. And I, mm. I had just had enough of the music business. I'd been doing it since I was 14 years old. Yeah. And I just walked away. Yeah. And I had a new a son, three year old son. And I decided to, you know, devote my time to him. Yeah. I was never missed a little league game or a hockey game. Yeah. He played and everything. Then in around two thousand, you were kind of choosing new life. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I didn't, was, even, yeah. I didn't even pick up a guitar. Yeah. And then in two thousand three, I picked up my um, nineteen sixty six Gibson three thirty guitar, <laughs> and I played this really cool with thirteen year old strings on it. And I yeah. played, <laughs> played this really cool riff, and I thought, oh hell, I, I've got to write this song now. So about fifteen <laughs> minutes, I wrote it was the Stiv Bader's ghost story. I wrote a homage to him, uh-huh. and it ended up in the movie about him oh, and okay. everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it uh-huh. helped. Uh, um, we made a couple other demos with Pete Revere at his studio, Amprion in Youngstown, and I sent them out to Bomb because I didn't mm-hmm. know anybody else. And I thought what what they would think and, and um they said well we can't really uh, uh do much with this you know it's not our things but we know this uh, label in japan vivid sound records they love it so <laughs> i sent them off on an email and 
In 12 hours, they offered us a recorded contract. <laughs> and there I am all those years with Blue Ash trying to get something, and it took that easy doing these oh. new demos. And that's how the Deadbeat Poets started. Then we got hooked up with Mark Hirschberger at Pop Detective Records. Mm-hmm. This is in 2006, and we've had like eight or nine albums out, I think, of wow. uh, mm-hmm. Deadbeat Poets. Uh-huh. And uh, it gets played all over the world. It's good, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is Bob still exist? Bomp, oh yeah, they're still bumping, and the live records are still run out of that. Susie Shaw still runs that. Susie's still and there. And Patrick yeah. Wassell, he runs the Alive part of it. And they all, yeah, they have new releases all the time and tour support. They're still going. Well, thank, thank God for the Japanese. Right? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> it's funny how they, I mean, I know this is almost a cliche, but they love these niche bands and, and music and stuff. It's like we still, well, I, I know you, you have to been contacted i mean i've had people from japan like email me how they got my email i don't know and and just like you know looking for like a unit 545 yeah, you know yeah, or, or our album that was on nick's label clone J- but well, it's just it's just and i'm always amazed you know i'm like how do you even know about well you this? remember but, i i had a japanese band on my label totsuza well, and don ball <laughs> right, on yes. bowling balls from hell volume two they were uh right tra- uh, that name translated <laughs> translates into sudden cardboard <laughs> it's a great, oh, great young band at the time. Well, yeah, they they yeah. would do things with Blue Ash and doing a promo for it, Blue Ash, and they get it. They said Blue Ash, and they put in parentheses means Nakamura Spring Fragrance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, but George Cabin is speaking. Of George, he, he used to tell me that he they he would get requests for the the single that Hammer Damage put out, that Automatic Lips. Really? Remember that? And it, people oh, yeah. wouldn't want to pay him three hundred dollars for it, yeah. one copy of it. Yeah. And Blue Ash is like that too. I get them from all over the world. I get them from Uruguay, mm-hmm. you know, Australia. I've had people call me from Australia in the middle of the night and ask me how we got this guitar sound. Yeah, they oh, find my phone number. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it is great. It it's is amazing. Cool. <laughs> I said, "Well, that's you play it through a Leslie speaker." Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and you did. Yeah. 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 That's how we got it, you know? yeah, yeah. Played it through an organ Leslie speaker. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an old Beatle Eric Clapton trick there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right, right. Man. Who produced the Blue Ash albums? The Blue Ash first album was produced by um, uh, John Grazier who worked at Peppermint, and okay. he produced a lot of people. And then the second one was produced by Steve Friedman, who did manage and produce Left End, too. Oh, okay. And he, he had worked at Peppermint one time, but broke off, and he's the one who got us the deal with Playboy Records. Okay. Yeah. Was Left End from the Youngstown area? Yeah, yeah they're from Youngstown, all Youngstown guys. I, I, Patsy, the drummer, I, he's the only one I still stay in touch with a lot. And he wrote a book, too, and he's out in Las Vegas. He moved there to be with okay. his daughter. I was just curious because those albums, the stuff that I've heard, had such a clean sound. Yeah, you know, yeah. Which yeah. Is, Amazing. Again, something that uh, I think sets uh, that stuff apart from a lot of bands at that time. Peppermint yeah. Records, Peppermint Productions is still a going concern. Like I said, they're really going to release all these. They released The Glass Harp. Yeah. They, they released that um, Rat Race album that we're on. with, And they're going to do Blue Ash. Uh, yeah reissues and stuff like that, stuff that was in the studio no one's ever heard. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. The uh, When Stiv died so weirdly and suddenly, that had to be a, it's kind of a traumatic thing for yeah, people. Yeah, it, 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 it was strange, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, um, a friend, a mutual friend of mine named Bobby Braybatt lives down south down in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. He called me, and I could tell by the tone in his voice, he says, hey, guys, Frank, I have some bad news. And I said, how did he die? I knew he died. Oh, I just yeah. knew it. And then he uh-huh. told me what had happened. Yeah. Not, you know, leaving the emergency room and all that and just right. leaving home. You know, but, well, yeah, that was tough. Yeah. Well, it was real interesting. All these years, I, you know, I heard the different stories and, and uh, you know, about him being hit by a car and mm-hmm. dying. But oh, five or six years ago, one of our, one of the Bizarro shows, a, a girl came, was, you know, to see our show. And she was from the Cleveland area. I started talking, and she told me that uh, Stiv was staying at her apartment in France at the time, and he got hit by the, you know, when he got hit mm-hmm. by the car, you know, he only shook it off or whatever, yeah. and he went back and he died at, at her apartment that night, or the or the next mm-hmm. morning or something. So I mean, he didn't die right away. No, he didn't. No, no. he died asleep. No, that's yeah. what I've heard too. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, this is a lesson for all of us idiot men Mm-mm. out there because I, I can totally see myself doing that. Get it by a okay. car and then go and yeah, somehow. I'll be all right. Yeah, it was yeah, ironic yeah. with him because he did that car surfing all the time. You know, oh. and I, it would always blow my mind when he did it. I would get real nervous. Yeah. And he would do that, and nothing ever happened with that. And, you know, getting just knocked to the ground by something, he gets. Yeah. It, you get yeah. a blood clot or whatever it was. Yeah, just a fluke. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is From Akron and Beyond. I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. And we are talking with Frank Sessage of Blue Ash and uh, Stiv Bader's band and Club Wow and the Deadbeat Poets. Boy, there's a lot of music there. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> a lifetime of music there. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Frank is a writer as well. And he's written uh, the first book, Circum- this is your first book. Yeah, first okay. book, yeah. Circumstantial Evidence, Untold Stories of an Original Rock and Roller. And you have a new book out uh, coming out uh, at the end of the year. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. It's called Not That Way Anymore. Okay. And it's... um. I wrote the first book in 2015, so not that way anymore. It's about things that have happened since 2015 okay. and now. But half of it's still old stories, too. <laughs> I kept remembering all the old Stiff stories and Blue Ash stories. Right. And there's some very, very funny things. In okay, it. Yeah. good, good, so. good. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, a lot uh, of fun. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm going to make a wild speculation here from the title that it's kind of how your life is just changed. Personally, yeah, right? Yeah, personally these years. and yeah. and yeah. and professionally, it's 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 different. A lot of things happening now. There's a lot of real cool stuff happening now. Like I had mentioned to you before about the Daisy Jones and the Six series yeah. on, on Amazon Prime. Blue Ash have a song in there in, yeah. in episode one called Jaisal Jane. Right when the um, Daisy decides she's going to be a rock star and writes mm-hmm. in her diary, right. and, it, and then it uh, segues over to the Dunn brothers in Pittsburgh, which is <laughs> ironic because we were playing in Pittsburgh right around the same time. That so the music, whoever did the music for that, really knew their stuff wow, okay. and to get the right sound. Yeah. And um, it's now, up for nine Emmy Awards in January. So mm. it's someone else doing your song? No, it's us. Oh, it's okay. It's Blue the Ash. actual, yeah, it's beautiful. Blue Ash. Beautiful, Great. yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of cool stuff like that. I mean, I was involved with a lot of movies. Um, 2019, the Stiv movie, Stiv, No Compromise, No Regrets. I saw that. I had like about five songs in there. And I'm interviewed in the movie, me and Jimmy C. were a lot of people, Lords of the New oh, Church, right. different yeah. people. And they had the world premiere up at uh, Cinematheque in, right. in, yeah. in Cleveland. And then I attended premieres in, in New York and Philadelphia and different places, yeah. too. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. I got those soundtracks. I uh, got a song in the Brian Jones movie, uh, Brian Jones' Life and Death of a Rolling Stone, a mm-hmm. song called Riding the Dog, and the new Maxis movie, Kansas City, that came out. I have a song called uh, Dead Bee Poets in there called uh, Sunglass City in that. Oh. And it's played all, all the way through. And Alice Cooper's in there. He's made, made star of that movie t- oh, talks about Maxis. Yeah. So we're getting in movies and TV, so it's kind of cool in, in this day and age. Um, well, I was cool. just going to say, I, sorry to interrupt, but I was just going to say that um, you seem to me to be epitomizing uh, somebody who has had a long career in music and how you can still make it work. Yeah, because it, it, the music fun. industry now is so weird. And, yeah, it's real strange. And you're strange. talking about getting, uh, you know, you you have pretty good luck getting your songs placed. Yeah, because yeah, I know, it's real unusual. I know some people it's that, hard. that you would think could get their songs yeah. placed, and they all they do is complain that they can't. Yeah, but the never difference works. is those are they're really good songs, and they're from a period that people are yeah. there's a longing for. You know? Yeah, well, yeah. Look, a guy from um, New York City, uh, Jeremy Thompson, he's with Reminder Records, got a hold of me. He goes, "Look, I have this plate. I can place things in in films." He goes, "You know, give me a chance." I, yeah, I like the old Blue Ash stuff. I said, "Okay, I'll sign for a year. We'll see if mm-hmm. it happen." And didn't he get that? And it was amazing, you know. Yeah. So so it, that opened up a lot of doors for us. Um, a lot of new stuff's coming out like that, and it, it was just fun working on Danny Garcia's movies too. Right. Three movies with that, so right. And you also, I mean, you you're having this this cool success with getting things placed in, which is really the only way you can get music heard anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yet, you were at a time when. It, which was the glory days of yeah. making albums and you know and putting them out there and touring and and you know hoping that 
You know, you knew that you had an audience for that for the oh, music, yeah. and people don't now. You know, I just oh. know so many younger musicians now who are incredibly talented, yeah. and it's just it's you just know hard. you're competing with ten zillion other things because it's all just online. How do you you know even access it? We got know? really lucky with the Deadbeat Poets because we had a champion in uh, Steve Van Zandt. Oh, okay, Steve, okay, and he. Uh, so you played it on his he, radio yeah, show? Yeah, we've had three oh, uh, wow. uh, cool songs in the world on Little Stevens Underground Garage. Oh, that is And huge. they still yeah. play about six of our songs regularly uh-huh. on, on the 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 uh, uh, Sirius XM. Okay. I get regular royalty yeah. checks from that, so we've nice. still got a lot of play on that. And a lot of people know us from that, you yeah. know, doing that. We've had Johnny Sincere on as a uh, cool song in the world, um, Staircase Stomp, and mm-hmm. The Man with the X-Ray Eyes. And Johnny Sincere was voted... Um, Excuse me, number two for the whole world in 2013, I think. Wow, okay. Because by the uh, people that listen to that, yeah, uh, listen to that show, yeah. and that shows on on countries all over the world. It's yeah, secret. and, and it's his lo- listeners, his everywhere. listeners are devoted to. Yeah, I yeah. have a few friends who are. Well, it's, you know, little Steven from uh, Springsteen's band, and and he has a he's had a long running yeah. serious radio show. Uh, on the serious network, yeah, I should yeah. say, and uh, and it, it's based, it's it's kind of garage rock, yeah. uh, you know, nuggets type stuff, real you know, real classic era kind of stuff. And he plays a lot of new bands. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I got an email yesterday, huh, Lisa? And, and uh, uh, this guy says, uh, "Little Steven just played a uh, um, well, Palmyra, Palmyra Del Ram, one of the DJs, they just played Abracadabra by Blue Ash. <laughs> it's cool, you know? Yeah, and yeah. people take snapshots of it and send them to me daily if it's on there that we heard circumstantial <laughs> yeah. evidence here a million miles away here. Yeah. And take the snapshot of their car <laughs> radio. <laughs> <laughs> playing it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so he's on the road, okay? And, and yeah. when the Skiv <laughs> movie played in, in um, New York, I sat next to Steve and got to know him. I had never met him before. Oh, yeah. Really cool guy. Yeah, he nice. bought my book, too, at the, at, at the Oh, nice. <laughs> it's a stand, so it's pretty cool. And Dave Treat's book too. They had oh, okay. The, the, the uh, Dead Boys thing. He bought both books there at the yeah. at the merch stand. So that was cool. Yeah, yeah. I met him a couple of times. A really great guy. Yeah, really cool guy. Well, he really loves the music, mm-hmm. and it comes through. Yeah, he cares. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, do you have any other projects on uh, the horizon uh, here that you just, can talk what, about? What will happen is when the new book comes out, I'll go out and tour again. I tour with a, a band called. Uh, the Ghetto Blasters from Tennessee, okay. and they're very, very good, very good punk band. Uh-huh. And uh, I go up and do a couple songs with them and do an acoustic set. And then mm-hmm. they usually set something up at a bookstore, a record store during the day, and I do a little acoustic set, tell stories and stuff. So I have a lot of fun with that. So once this comes out, I'll be going on the road with them okay. again. I haven't been on the road. I played one place in Sandusky. Uh, last summer, but that's the only place I played since 2019. It's the last tour I did with them before COVID started. Right, right. And then I, I, I had some illness. I think I told you I've had some uh, problems, so I yeah. got COVID really bad. I'm still having a lot of residual effects from it. Yeah. So, um, and I have a few other things that going on with health issues but yeah. I, i'm still going to be able to go out and play so good i'm looking forward to that so that's what i'll be doing in 2024 Great. and then we, we got a new blue ash album in the can too we're trying to finish new stuff oh. and another deadbeat poets once and we have this um club wild circumstantial club wild no we're fast gonna be a released on colored vinyl out of peppermint too. So okay wow. a lot of Man. stuff going on Who's in Who's in Blue the Blue Ash? That's uh, new me stuff. and Jim Kenzer, the lead singer, okay. and three Deadbeat poets. Um, that would be J- John Corey, uh-huh. John Lumick on bass, and uh, Pete Revere on uh, on lead guitar. And we took that band touring in 2016 through 18. We played. We did a tour of Spain, which was great. Wow. We do the Deadbeat poets the first set, and then bring Blue, Jim up for Blue Ash the second set. Yeah. So you got two bands for the price of one. <laughs> and then we, we toured uh, Europe uh, before, too. We toured um, Germany and Denmark and uh, Czech Republic, Sweden. And uh, we toured England. And then I toured England. I brought my wife and my son with me in 2019. Wow. Just did a book tour and toured around, played acoustic guitar. So that was pretty cool. 
Nick, this guy's busier than ever yeah. than, than anybody yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of easy to set up. We have a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, uh, I'm starting to feel really lazy all of a sudden. The acoustic stuff's nice because you take my take my acoustic twelve string and just set up and play. I mean, I I, I even like going into uh, record stores. I won't even use the sound system. Mm. Old school busking with just yeah. shout it out like Blind Lemon Jefferson, yeah. or <laughs> and people love it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really exciting. This is inspiring, too. No, it is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been From Akron and Beyond. I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. And uh, we've had a great conversation what here. A great show. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot, and I got a whole lot of music I'm going to be checking out when I get home, that's for sure. Uh, I, all these bands sound great. I've heard some of your stuff, but I didn't realize just how varied and all the different bands that you have. It's yeah, really fantastic. I think you'll enjoy it. It's, it's a good lesson. It sounds right yeah. up my alley, for sure. So, Thank you so much. Uh, it's been great having you thank here. You so thank you, guys. It was really, really a lot of fun. Okay, nice. thanks. And folks, we'll see you next time. Next time.